Good morning. If you would take your Bibles, I'll be brought a Bible with you. Turn to Hebrews chapter two. In just a few minutes, we're gonna jump into Hebrews chapter two in in the series, The Race. And as you're turning there, I wanna say, as you've already heard today, just my own appreciation for our Shine ministry. Uh, For a number of months, I wanted to do this, just have a day where we celebrate how God is using that ministry. So powerful. And I I think God just smiles at what's happening uh, with our Shine ministry. And so who knows, maybe, maybe some of you would love to take a next step in serving that great ministry, and I can't imagine a better one than that. Also, if you're a guest today, love having you here. I would love to meet you in our Explore gathering right after this service uh, in room 105, just for about 15 minutes. If you have a few minutes, would love to spend some time with you. So in my world right now, we're talking a lot about driving. I've got a new driver, a 16-year-old daughter, started driving, pray for us, and uh, no, she's actually a really good driver. She's doing a great job. And so, like a lot of parents, when your kids get this age, you're teaching them to drive, and so we've been on a lot of practice drives, and there have been a number of times where we'll see a road sign that you're supposed to pay attention to, and she'll ask, Dad, what is that? And, And I'll say something, but I'm thinking, I, I, I don't know what that sign is, honestly. I, I have no idea what, <laughs> what that means. So, so it's been a good time. Yeah, this is actually not one of them, but this is, this is something I thought <laughs> will be fun. We'll just go there. All right, this will be fun. All right, so I thought, what are some of the most random signs that you could see driving on the road today? Maybe in this country or other countries. And so this would be a good example. Like if you're driving around and you see, you don't know what's happening to the left, but there are tomatoes and it's not good. You need to be cautious Whatever, whatever that is. Uh, here, here's another one that you might see. So if the cow doesn't kill you, the rocks will. You need to know that. You need to be prepared for this because there are cows jumping off of mountains everywhere, wherever, wherever this is. Here, here's another one. Yeah, so uh, this is the world's largest mosquito, apparently. Some crazy... I don't know if that's Minnesota or where that is, where the mosquitoes are that big, but uh, you, you gotta watch out. If, if you're handicapped, here's another one you need to be aware of. There are alligators. <laughs> you just gotta be careful. You don't know what's gonna happen. And, and finally, I don't know if you've seen this one. Uh, do not make cucumber. So, I, I did, honestly, I didn't know that we could make cucumbers, but apparently... Apparently you can, and, and maybe you've seen signs like these and others, and they are designed to get you to pay attention. And in a way, that is what Hebrews chapter two is all about. This is what we call a warning passage. If you are here for the first time, we are about five weeks into a series walking through the book of Hebrews. And as we're going through verse by verse, I'm trying to teach you some of the unique features of this book, not just so that you'll think that's neat, but you see how the author's using these to help us walk closer with Jesus. This today is the first of five warning passages throughout the book of Hebrews. And as we go week by week, we'll encounter others. But this is the first warning passage. This this is a passage that's meant to say, hey, we've been talking about who Jesus is, and what that means, but we're gonna take a time out and just say, look in the mirror. How are you doing in your relationship with Jesus? That's what this passage is kind of a, hey, pay attention, wake up, look at this sign. What does it say about your relationship with Jesus? So let's do as we do every week. Let's read it in its entirety and then understand what it means. And as we do every single Sunday, let's stand together in honor of God who's given us this word Hebrews chapter two, verses one through four. Here's what the author of Hebrews says. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, And every violation and act of disobedience received a just punishment. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. 
God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Father, as we open up this warning passage, I pray that, God, we would not only see what it says, but we would do what you're telling us to do. All of us are walking in this campus this morning from different places, backgrounds, emotional states, but God, would you speak to all of us through your word, by your spirit? And we'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You guys have a seat. The meaning of this warning passage is found in verse one, and it's pretty explicit. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure out what it says. But he says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. This is what we're gonna say about the first warning. It's this. This is what this passage is saying. Pay attention so that you don't drift away. That's the warning, the warning of this warning passage. Pay attention so that you don't drift away. He he says in the beginning of verse 1, For this reason, what reason? He's building off of what he's already said all throughout chapter one. In chapter one, verse one, we heard this foundational truth that Jesus is God's final word. God has spoken in these last days in his son. So if you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus. What does God think? What does Jesus think? Jesus, of course, is God. Jesus is the revelation of God. And in light of the fact that God has said everything he wants to say through Jesus, for this reason, going back here to chapter two, we should pay attention to what we have heard. When we hear about Jesus and his message and his mission and what he wants for you and me, we need to pay attention to that. Not only that, he says pay much closer attention. Don't just glance at this, don't just drive by, Stop and dwell on this. Pay attention, close attention. And then he gives us the purpose. Why should we pay attention? So that we do not drift away from it. We pay attention so that we don't drift away from it. Today we're talking about the danger of drifting. Drifting can be dangerous. No one tries to drift. But when we stop being intentional, drifting is the inevitable result. Maybe you've drifted in your life. I remember going deep sea fishing, and as long as the boat was moving, I was fine. But when we turned the motor off and it started to rock and we started to drift, that's, that's when we threw up. That's what happens. You get sick when you drift. Drifting. When I've taken my kids to the beach, especially when they were younger and learning to go out deeper and deeper into the ocean, you would have to teach them as a parent, you need to keep your eye on this one central place, whether it's a hotel or a house or a flagpole or or something, keep your eye here because if you're not careful, you will drift. You won't try to drift, but if you stop being intentional about knowing where you are, the inevitable result is that you will drift and you can get in a lot of danger if you drift. People drift in the ocean. Lots of different things drift. Companies drift. We can think of a number of companies that might have been very popular years ago that went out of business, not because of one colossal mistake, but maybe they drifted away from their mission or they didn't adapt. I do think, however, it was ironic. Like I think about a company like Sears. The other day, we got in the mail a catalog from Amazon with a bunch of toys in it. I thought the irony of this Right, that, that when you're a kid, you looked at the Sears catalog for all these toys and Sears went out because you know, companies like Amazon came and, and, and won the day through the internet. But now even these internet companies are now producing catalogs for you to look at toys again. I think just the irony of all this. Companies drift. Sports teams can drift. Coaches can drift. I, I read an article recently about Ed Orgeron. Remember him? He was the coach of the LSU Tigers. Go Tigers, you know, that guy. <laughs> And there was this, uh, this article about how he had lost his way when they got 
and they won the national championship, his life derailed. He got caught up in a lot of things and drifted away from who he wanted to be. Marriages can drift. I've talked to a lot of married couples, and they are at a point often where they think, we need to separate, we need to get a divorce. And not always, but many times if you ask, what happened? Was there some event? Was there infidelity? Was there some major? And, and oftentimes the answer is no. There wasn't some major thing, that, but it was just over time, decision by decision, not being an intentional, just they, they just they drift. Churches can drift from their mission. And this is a passage that is to believers today that is telling us that if we don't pay attention, if we don't keep paying attention to what we have heard about Jesus, we as believers will drift. No one wakes up and says, I I'm gonna, if you're a true believer, I'm gonna just stop thinking about the gospel, I'm gonna stop living for Jesus, I'm gonna stop paying attention. No, no one does that if you're a genuine follower of Jesus. But if we stop paying attention, we can drift. This is a passage written primarily to believers. And the main concern here is this. The main concern here is not for those who reject the gospel, but for those who neglect the gospel. And that could be true of every single one of us, including your pastor. So we need to pay attention. This is a serious text, a serious warning it's easy to stop paying attention, isn't it? I see this every time I fly on a plane. You know that when you get on the plane, before the plane takes off, the attendants are doing their deal with the safety regulations, seat belts, and the what do you do in case of a water landing? That's another word for a crash, anyways. But you look around, and no one's paying attention. Everyone's got their AirPods on, they're reading the book, they're looking at their phone. I mean, they don't, they don't even try to police that anymore. Everyone's just, no one's paying attention except for one person. You know who that is? The person who's never flown before. And they're like this. And they're reading that manual. You know, they're looking at the images. Where's the raft? Where's the thing? I, I flew on a plane with a guy earlier this year. He was, he was flying to Dallas to pick up a truck that he had bought, and then he was gonna drive it back to Georgia. And it took me about, Point three seconds to figure out this guy's never been on a plane. He was probably mid-40s, never been on a plane. He, he took his bag, and when he got to the seat, he didn't know what to do with it, so he just sat on it, you know? <laughs> and the, and the, the attendant was like, sir, you got to put that overhead bin. He's like, what's the overhead bin? He didn't, oh, man, that thing opens. He didn't, you know, he didn't. And, you know, the, so the whole ride, I mean, everything the attendant said, he's paying attention, everything. Every time a, a plane had a little bump, you know, he's like, what was that? You know, he just talked and talked. The, the little cart came by with the drinks and stuff, and he's like, man, I get, I get that for free? I was like, yeah, man, get as much as you want, it's for free. I'm thinking, you paid for it. Anyways, but yeah, but yeah give, he just, he didn't know, he didn't know. So he's talking the whole time, he's nervous, he's never flown, you know, his eyes are like this the entire time. By the end, you know, we're talking, so what do you do for a living, he asked me. Well, I'm a pastor. Are you serious? I had, I had like a rabbit's foot the whole time. And, you know, and he's, yeah, I mean, this guy, oh man, he was awesome. And then, and then, of course, he unloads every theological question he could ever think. Hey, let me ask, say, I bet you've never been asked this. Let me think I've been asked that a million times. Anyways, what about the guy on the island who's never heard? Everyone's concerned about that guy. Anyways, and... But this guy, he was dialed in. He was locked into that plane. He's never been on one. It was his first time. When we follow Jesus, remember that first time you followed Jesus? And you're thinking, man, this is awesome. New creation, new world, new everything. But over time, it kind of becomes normal. Another Bible reading day, another... Another sermon, another church service. And before long, you just start to drift. I mean, the attendant's up here talking, but why pay attention to me when you could just go back to whatever's on your phone? This is a passage that is warning us that if we're not careful, we will drift away if we stop paying attention. We want to examine this and think about what this text says and maybe think about some areas of our life where we tend to neglect the Lord. Let's look at the passage first. I want to first start with two dangers 
of drifting. The first is found in verse two and the beginning of verse three. The first danger is this. If you drift, you will bring judgment on yourself. You will bring judgment on yourself. He says in verse two, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every violation and act of disobedience received a just punishment. He's gonna go on, but let's stop there. You remember what we said last week about the fact that the old covenant, the covenant given through Moses to Israel through the law? The New Testament tells us in verses like Galatians 3, 19 and Acts 7, 30 that it was mediated through angels. One of the reasons that the author is saying Jesus is superior to angels is because he's saying that the covenant Jesus brings is superior to the covenant that the angels brought with Moses and the law. And he says, just as the word the angels brought proved to be, he says, unalterable. That's a word that means trustworthy, binding. You had to do something with it. And then he goes on to talk about the negative consequences of that because he says, And every violation and act of disobedience. Your translation may say every transgression. You know what that word means? If you you trans something, you go across it. You go on a transatlantic flight. You go across the Atlantic. To To transgress God's law means that he has put boundaries around his people's lives for their good. And if you step outside of that boundary because you think you know what's better for your life than God, then you have, you have transgressed, gone across his will, and have now stepped into disobedience. And he said that what happens is that when God, even in his love, gives you his boundaries and you transgress them, you disobey them, then he says there's a just penalty. And as we think about Israel, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus, you never thought about any of this kind of stuff before. But for those of us who follow Jesus, who read the Bible, we see stories in the Bible about when God's people disobeyed his law and there were penalties. One such example I think about is Exodus 32 with the golden calf. Do you remember that? God delivered his people out of Egypt on the way to the promised land, had demonstrated his power through miracles parting of the Red Sea, a number of different things. And here Moses is up on Mount Sinai with Joshua. And Moses is convening with God and getting the law of God to bring to the people. But the people get impatient and they think, where is Moses? Has he he died? Has he forgotten about us? What, What about us down here? And you know what they did? They went back to their old ways. And they got all that gold that they got when they left Egypt. And they took some of it And through the help of Aaron, Aaron, Moses' brother, they made a statue out of it, a golden calf. And they begin to worship it and dance around it and sing around it. And Moses now comes back down from the mountain and Joshua hears sound and Moses says, what is that? Is that that the sound of war? And Joshua says, no, 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 no. They're partying. They're worshiping. And you remember that in Exodus 32, Moses comes down and he's holding these tablets and he sees the people prostrating themselves before this false pagan God. And in sense, he he, he destroys the tablets. How could you give up on this God that's given you everything? Delivered you from slavery. How could you give up on him? And so Moses then says, there's a penalty for this. And they burned the statue and they took the dust from the gold and they put it in water and said, all of you are gonna drink this. And they drank this bitter water laced with their idolatry. And then he said, all right, who's really for the Lord? And a group called the Levites said, we're for God. He says, here's what we're gonna do. And in an act of capital punishment within the nation of Israel, they then went about and killed thousands of men. And it's one of many such examples where they had a law, the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols before me. They disobeyed the law. They transgressed it. And there was a just penalty. Now, since Hebrews was most likely written to people who were Jewish, people who had come to see Jesus as the Messiah that they were waiting for, predicted from the scriptures, who knew this story, 
He then says, all right, you think that's bad, but think about what you know, Hebrews. And I'd say the same thing to you, John Safari. What do you know about Jesus? The, the Israelites had a piece of the puzzle, but you get a much clearer picture of all that God is doing. You have heard and seen the son and seen what he did on the cross to forgive you of your sin and seen what he has done in his resurrection and, and seen and heard what he said about coming back again, preparing this earth and the kingdom of God and all these things that he has done. If they who did not have a full picture received a just penalty, let me ask you a question. Here it is in verse three. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That is some kind of question. If we know what we know about Jesus and we neglect all of what that entails for our daily life, why do we think we're going to escape some kind of punishment? A number of different times in the book of Hebrews, there are passages that, if read a certain way, might suggest that we could lose our salvation. I'll go ahead and give you my take on that. I don't think there's anywhere in Hebrews nor the rest of the New Testament that says, if you are a genuine believer in Jesus, you can ever lose your salvation, ever. I do think there are a number of passages that raise the question that you need to ask, am I a legitimate follower of Jesus? But whatever this punishment is, the author doesn't say. But if they received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect this great salvation? You will bring judgment on yourself. So pay attention or you're going to drift. What's another danger of drifting? Number two, if you, if you stop paying attention, here's the second thing. You will consider God a liar. That's, that's a stark warning. But that's essentially what he's saying here. Look in verse three. He starts talking to them about how they received this word of Jesus and this gospel of Jesus. He says, after it was first spoken through the Lord... It was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. This gospel that saves you, that changes you, that reshapes your identity if you truly follow Jesus is a gospel that came, first of all, from the Son. He, Jesus came preaching. He was a preacher. He was more than a preacher, but he was a preacher. And he came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, now that I am here, things are totally different, and you need to make changes in light of the fact that I am here. And this gospel, this message that Jesus preached, it came from Jesus, and then, of course, he invested in his apostles who then wrote all the things down that he said and did, and that's why we have the New Testament today, inspired by the Holy Spirit through the writing of the apostles. And then he says something here that's interesting that tells us a little bit about Hebrews. He says, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. In other words, this is a congregation that most likely did not have an apostle in it. This is a congregation that most likely was living after the time of Jesus. These are people who never saw Jesus physically. And in that way, they are very similar to us. None of us have seen Jesus physically, but we're staking our lives upon what we have heard of Jesus, this authoritative word. And God confirmed his word through the apostles in lots of different ways. He says through miracles and signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. We read of that, particularly in the book of Acts. It's, it's, it's God saying, this thing that you've heard about Jesus, this gospel comes with my confirmation, my affirmation. This time of year, you start seeing these commercials, election season. Is it ever not election season? And you've seen these commercials. If you vote for this candidate, you will ruin the galaxy. Uh, <laughs> and then the end of the commercial, um, I'm such and such, and I approve this message, you know. 
What's happening in this passage is saying all that Jesus demonstrated in his life, all of his teachings, his death on the cross, all that he revealed about God, God has affirmed that. Jesus called for life change. Jesus said, you can't follow me and be in the same. Jesus said, if you wanna follow me, you gotta die to self, take up your cross and follow me. So if, if, if we look and hear what Jesus says and do nothing different, then essentially what we are saying to God is that you are a liar. because it hadn't done anything in our life. We're not doing anything different. We're not changing anything. We're not trying to change anything. It's like C.S. Lewis said, a lot of you know this. When you hear about Jesus, you have to make a decision. Either he is a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Maybe he is a lunatic. Why would I base my life on the teachings of a crazy man who says that if you believe in me, you can go to heaven when you die? Maybe he's a liar. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I think he said that to comfort his disciples. But if we think Jesus is only a way, and if you follow other religions, that's just as cool, whatever works for you, then essentially you're calling him a liar. Or just maybe he's the Lord. And this passage is saying that God has confirmed this final word in Jesus. So we should pay attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away. I'll tell you that all of us have a tendency to drift, me too. It's like a tire with a slow leak in it. It doesn't explode on the highway, but just little by little, the air goes out, and before you know it, it doesn't work. And the same is true in our Christian life. I'm not saying that we lose our salvation, but I think that if we drift, we forfeit blessings. I think we forfeit rewards in heaven. And I think we forfeit the active presence of God in our life if we stop paying attention and we start to drift. Throughout the series in Hebrews, we're gonna look at a number of different passages that will be just like this today, a warning passage. This is a serious passage. But I thought in the last few minutes, I would at least do an an overview of some of the key areas that the author brings out in the book of Hebrews. And these allow us to ask questions about our own life. This is a message primarily to believers. This is not a message to unbelievers. And if you're not a believer in Jesus, we love that you're here. We want you to repent and believe in the gospel, believe in Jesus as the son of God who died on the cross to save you of your sins. But this is a passage to the already convinced who don't have a tendency to reject it, but they have a tendency to neglect it. What are some of these areas of neglect? There are four. Number one, we neglect applying the gospel to our daily lives. Sometimes we truncate the gospel into nothing more than God's plan for us to go to heaven when we die. And the gospel is that. But the gospel is more than that. Paul talked about in Colossians that he came to proclaim this mystery, this great thing that was once hidden but is now revealed. What is the mystery? Here's the mystery, Christ in you. That that the gospel is this righteousness that I have in Christ that changes me. It's like I get a pair of glasses and everything looks different and I have different different want-tos, different desires. It changes who I am from the inside out. The gospel is not simply the minimal requirements to get into heaven when I die. It is not just the ABCs. The gospel is the XYZs of the Christian life. And when when I stop applying the gospel to my life daily, it'll lead to drift. Hebrews chapter three says it like this. Take care, brothers and sisters. He's talking to Christians, brothers and sisters, that there will not be any of you with an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Paul one time talked about one of his traveling companions named Demas. And he said that Demas left him. And here's why he said he left him. He said, he left me because he fell in love with this present world. And even as believers, we can fall in love with this present world, with our careers, with our sports teams, with our bank account, with our beauty, with our politics, with our sex, with our you name it. 
We gotta apply the gospel to our lives daily or we'll drift. Number two, we neglect spiritual growth. These are all somewhat connected, but we neglect spiritual growth. Look what he says in Hebrews 5. Talking about Jesus, he says, concerning him, we have much to say, and it's difficult to explain why, since you have become poor listeners. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is, is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is, what's the word? He's an infant. Now, when you see a little baby sucking on a bottle of milk, it's cute. When you see a 22-year-old doing it, it's creepy. <laughs> Assuming he or she has the power to do otherwise. And I think there's a two-sided coin here that God will take us as we are. Sometimes we hear that phrase, you know, God accepts you as you are. And, and I say amen, right? Because if you sinned, which we all have, no matter what religion you come from, no matter what your family life was like, no matter what your experiences are like, no matter all that stuff, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, amen? And, and all of us come to faith in Christ the same way, repenting of our sin, putting our full faith and trust in Jesus and receiving the grace that comes from him. But sometimes we say things like, God accepts you as you are, and I think sometimes we interpret that to mean, well, then you can just stay that way the rest of your life. Because I'm good, I got the grace of God. I mean, yeah, my life's a mess, but at least, hey, I got the grace of God, which is true. But can I push on the other side of that coin? God loves you so much that he accepts you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And if I could say it even more pointed, God accepts you in spite of you and loves you too much to leave you there. This is a passage to believers where we need to appropriately say, you need to grow up. You've been walking with Jesus for 25 years and you're still drinking milk out of a bottle. You need to grow up in the things of the Lord. We all deal with sin, but you, you are not waging war with sin in any kind of way that would help you to follow in the ways of Jesus. Romans 6 tells us, do not let sin master over you, which tells me that apparently that is possible to do. But if we don't take sin seriously, we don't take our walk with Jesus seriously, you look like a baby instead of an adult. Somebody said this, sin will take you farther down than you wanna go, keep you longer than you wanna stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And that's true for the believer. That goes to number three. If we're not careful, we will neglect the role of God's discipline. Discipline. Yesterday I went to a cross country meet. It was state championships for middle school. My uh, sixth grade daughter was running in that race and the team did a great job. And after the race, the coach, is just a great coach, he and his wife were given the speech at the end of the year. And he just reminded them this metaphor that running has for life. And he said a lot of great things. One of the things that stuck with me, he said this, you need to learn this about life, that you will never grow until you embrace discomfort. And the same is true in the Christian life. You will never grow in the things of the Lord until you learn the healthy role that God's discipline plays. God's discipline is not punitive always. We always think about discipline as a bad word, like God wants to spank us or whip us or scourge us. But his great love for us of his father means that he wants us to be disciplined in our life. Hebrews chapter 12 says it like this. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them, shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, meaning earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time that seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant, right? But painful. Yet, here's the yet to the believers in the room today. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, 
afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline and discipleship come from the same word. I'll be honest with you, spiritual growth is not all that complex. If you wanna grow spiritually, you do a few things really well over and over again. You know what they are? You spend unhurried time with God in prayer. You spend time in his word. You learn disciplines like fasting. You learn to give money. You learn to share your faith, learn to disciple others. You learn how to worship corporately. There's probably, what, eight or 10 things? It's really not that hard. You know what's really hard? Your desire to want to. Embrace the discomfort and reap the fruit of righteousness. If you don't, you'll drift. A lot of you are drifting. Number four. This is found in Hebrews chapter 10, but number four is this. We neglect meeting together as a church. I think this verse means a lot more to us in 2022 than it did in 2019, right? Right? You think about the last few years and the craziness of churches not gathering. It's crazy to me that there are still some churches not gathering because it's a direct violation of what God has told us to do. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I've seen people drift in this way. A lot of competition for our time, isn't there? I mean, you got that kid's baseball league, that wedding, that hiking trip you want to go on. Just tired Saturday, man, it's up late, football game. You miss a Sunday, turns into two, turns into three. I've seen a lot of people just drift getting away from the holy habit of meeting together. Can I tell you something? You cannot do church appropriately online. You can listen to sermons. You can listen to music. But let's stop calling that church. Because church takes physicality. It takes hugs, and it takes handshakes, and it takes encouragement, and it takes stimulating one another to love and good deeds. It takes the passing of the elements in the Lord's Supper. It takes the, the baptizing of new believers in Christ. See, these are four of a million examples in Hebrews that get at this idea, are we paying attention? If we don't, we will drift. Uh, I want us to see uh, and wrap up our, our time today with a, with a short video it captures one of those things that only happens in community, and that's a baptism. We had a baptism service two weeks ago. We were able to baptize one of our Shine participants, and in fact, Lynn, her son Isaac, and her did it together, and you're gonna hear a little bit about that story. But before we jump to that, I'm gonna end with this. I have a professor friend who wrote a great book on the book of Hebrews, a commentary and I've heard him preach on Hebrews in this passage, and he asks a question to his church, and, and I think it's a good one for us to think about too. He, he said this statement. He said, I, I know how close you are to Jesus, all of you. He looked around, you know, you over here, I, like I know how close you are to Jesus. These kids right there, like I know how close you are to Jesus. Person in the sanctuary, right-hand side, I can see you. I'm just kidding. I know how close you are to Jesus. And you go around the room, you're thinking, honestly, how, how do you know how close I am to Jesus? And he would say this, you are as close to Jesus as you wanna be. Do you wanna be close to Jesus? Pay attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. Father, thank you for warning passages like this that remind us of the severity of turning our eyes to things that don't ultimately matter. There are a lot of people in our church today who are drifting. There are a lot of people in our church who aren't here today who are drifting. Lord God, would we hear this passage well? Would we pay attention? God, I can't convict people, but you can by your spirit. 
So I pray that you would do what only you can do in this moment. God, as we see this baptism, it reminds us of your grace. It reminds us that grace through faith is not built upon our intellectual knowledge of you, but it's built upon the work that you have done for us. And so we celebrate that. We celebrate life change. We celebrate someone being a new creation in Christ. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. May we live on mission this week so that others might experience the same. God, we rejoice in what we're about to see as we celebrate life change. And we'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen.